many books have affected the world. Do you agree with that? <laughs> many books have affected uh, the history of this world. Uh, and what you read really affects you and I as well, the material you read. And I was thinking of uh, a man by the name of Adolf Hitler and how his book influenced the world at that time, during before World War II. And he would read uh, Nietzsche's books, and Nietzsche, the philosopher, and he just made a statement, and one of his statements is, is that God is dead. And so he's famous for that statement, but this is who Hitler would read and study, and so he ended up writing a book, maybe you've heard it, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, and uh, if you've been anywhere in Germany and seen the Holocaust, we see what the result of his book was and the reading of that that caused even children who really got into it in the Nazi youth to rebel against their parents and to all uh, kinds of evil they got into by the influence of this book and trying to influence the youth in this way. And it does have an effect on people, so it's important. And Paul, Hitler knew you had to get to the youth to really accomplish anything. And so it is today, too, it's important for us to realize what, uh, uh, what we feed the children, what we instill in their minds and so on, will have an eternal effect or effect of their life here in this world as well. And so the end of Mein Kampf actually was also the, the uh, concentration camps and the six million uh, Jews slaughtered and so on and far beyond that, the many things that went on. And that has affected, uh, it's kind of beyond our time, I guess, uh, that that happened for most of us. So uh, it's kind of behind us in some ways, people think. But uh, another man wrote a book that's called The Origin of the Species that continues to have an effect on you and I today. And in schools, you study about him. And uh, that was, of course, Charles Darwin and uh, wrote a theory. But as we teach, most teachers that teach it today teach it as fact. And yet it has affected many people in the, the history, really, this world. And so books have an impact on people. And, uh, and especially when society grabs it, begins to use it as something to teach. But if you'd open up your Bible here this morning to the book of Romans. Here before us we have this morning a book that has changed the world as well. Uh, no other book has sold more copies. And so... But this book of Romans has also had an effect on many people's lives as well. And I'm just going to bring a couple people before you that you, I'm sure you've probably heard of. You've probably heard of the Roman Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther, right? Uh, he was, grew up to study law. It was really what he was going to do, study law, according to his dad. His dad really pushed him in that way, but by the time he got 21, he decided he was going to go to a monastery and seek God. And He really, one thing that bothered him is, how do I get right with God? That was a thought in his mind, is how do I get right with God? And he thought by going to the monastery, it would help and things. And he tried everything. He worked, he fasted, he prayed, he did everything he could. Uh, to please God, but after all of these things were done that he tried in achieving that place, he, he realized he wasn't there. He couldn't achieve it, and so he was partly discouraged. But you know what he began to do? And I encourage anybody to do is begin to read the book of Romans. Begin to study the Bible itself. And as he was reading the Bible one day, he came across uh, verse 17 of Romans chapter 1. And as he came across these words, and just all of a sudden, he, I'm sure, probably read before, perhaps, but shed new light on his life. And that was, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And it oh, turned a light on in his head, and he began to understand uh, the scriptures and uh, how, how to get right with God. He realized, again, it wasn't by his good works or by his religion or any ritual that he could do or even his good intentions. But it was the grace of God that he put his faith in what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. And uh, this year is actually the uh, 500th anniversary, 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. When Luther in uh, uh, much 500 years ago posted those theses on 
uh, on the door of the church and so on. And that revolutionized, uh, uh, it had an effect on people, the people around him in Germany, which continues really to have an effect on us. And the, the thing he was most to begin to get upset about was the sales of indulgences. And what's that mean is that people realize that in themselves they couldn't be good enough to attain, uh, to get right with God. There was not enough good in us to do it. So the church at that time had set up ways where they picked a treasury of saints in days gone by and their good works that you could actually treasure them up and you could the church would sell them to you to help help your measure that's it's too low at least achieve a higher thing and so they would sell them and you could buy them for anybody you could buy them from yourself you could buy them for relatives and you could buy them for even the deceased those that were dead in hopes of of you know coming attaining to a better life or getting right and making peace with God and so you know and I'm not picking on anybody I think every church eventually sooner or later it's a sad thing in history as they go downhill you know, you go to Ephesus today or, or to Turkey, even today, and the, the churches that Paul started, some of those places don't even have a church anymore. Years have gone by, centuries have gone by. And, and somebody had always said this, and it's very true, that we're just one generation away from the extinction of the church. It means if you don't pass it on to your kids uh, and, 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 and uh, they don't have a relationship with God, don't get right with God, it's going to be gone. No matter how good the church started, you have that with almost every major denomination that started. They started out on fire for God. And they didn't even intend on starting a new denomination. That's just people. For instance, I'll take somebody, uh, the, the Wesleys. They had a method of doing things. And pretty soon it was kind of derogatory at some times. Oh, these guys are Methodists, you know, oh, methods, you know, or whatever. But it turned into a denomination. And as they're with us, there's one in town here today. And they started off so good, too. And God was in it. God used them in powerful ways. But over time, as you see the decline in, in uh, not saying that I've met some good born-again pastors that love. But you know what? You even got pastors, not, not just in the Methodist church. Uh, you have them in almost every denomination, Lutheran, whatever, that don't even believe the Bible is the word of God. And yet they're the preacher. That I don't understand it, but that's the way it is. And so we tend to fall down. What we probably need is another revival, wouldn't you say? When uh, the church goes downhill. And uh, there was another guy by the name, I've talked about John Wesley since I started with him. But uh, he, he'd even gone to, to Georgia in the United States here early in the 1700s and gone there to convert the Indians. And he realized at the end, here, I went to convert the Indians and yet who's going to convert me, he said later on in his own words. He wasn't right with God. He met some Moravians on the way back to England in a storm and he noticed the peace they had. And he just said something different. They, can, they talked to him about instant conversion that you could get right with God in a moment's time. And John hung on to that thought and he began more and more in contact with, with uh, some Moravians and they helped him thinking along these lines of how to get right with God. That's really uh, what he was talking about again. And I just want to read parts of his journal here to you just uh, so you can get an, uh, a, an idea of how things happen. But when he got back to England after being a missionary in the United States here, he, uh, he went back seeking God and uh, he opened his Bible on May 24th, 1738. He opened his Bible at about five in the morning and came across these words. There's given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises even that ye should be partakers of the divine nature. Words, this is on five o'clock in the morning, this passage he read, and it's for you and I today as well. It fell upon these words. Again, let me read them. They're given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Even that you and I should be partakers of the divine nature, that we actually can partake in the nature of God. Be right with God and so on. So he read that in the morning. He also read, you're not far from the kingdom of God. That same morning, he read other scriptures like this that showed him, I think, that gave him some kind of an encouragement that he's close. That you're close to being saved. And some people who seek God, God gives them stuff like that. They read a scripture or something in their mind clicks and wow, goes on. So he, he reads this in the morning. And then by evening, 
He'd read other places like that. In his journal, here he writes in the evening what he did. In the evening, I went unwillingly to a society on Aldersgate Street in London. Okay? Unwillingly. Get that. I just love this one. It blessed my heart this week when I was reading this again. But he went unwillingly to a meeting. You ever done that? How many of you came here this morning? Don't show your hands. <laughs> you came unwillingly. And yet, you know, even in those unwilling times, God works. You ever feel like not getting up in the morning and reading your Bible or something like that? I've, not generally, but there are times when I, I, I have like that. And, you know, in the times I've least felt like it, God has moved in my heart. And I, I, God has spoken to me. And it's just been a wonderful, best time. And I said, what, what if I just slept in? You know, I just I miss this. And it'd be wonderful times and so on. But so he goes unwillingly to this gathering on Aldersgate Street, where he where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. That means the introduction, Martin Luther's introduction to the book of Romans that converted him. He says, as they were reading it, about a quarter before nine, while I was while uh, they were describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ. Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. And saved me from the law of sin and death. And even the Methodists today have that day as kind of a special day in their liturgy and stuff. The day when the founder of the Methodist church Got right with God. See what happened. He went unwilling to this lead to this meeting, and yet what he'd been searching for all his life, he finally found a relationship with Christ. He realized his sins, even his, were forgiven. And he had the assurance of that fact. And it changed his life. His brother got saved, I think, three days before that. Charles Wesley. And if you look in our hymn book, you'll find hymns that he wrote. And uh, that started the great revival uh, with Whitfield as well. During that time here in America and in England, I mean, society had gotten so low. Public hangings were a thing to look forward to in, in England in those days. Public hangings. Ah, kids, let's go this morning. There's going to be a nice hanging out here. We're going to see so-and-so get home. You know, it, was, it became such a, such a, almost an enjoyment and a pleasure out of it. And God moved so much through John and Charles West. You know, he traveled, I think it was 250,000 miles by horse, up and down England, back and forth. On his horse, preaching the gospel every day of his life. And just what an amazing thing God continues even to do through the ministry of one, one, one person who gets right with God. Martin Luther got right with God, started a reformation. And through it, years later, almost 200 years later, John Wesley, while reading the preface to that book, a light came on inside. He understood and he came, became right with God. So see, this book that we really have before us, it, today is going to be an introduction to this book. And what I'd like to do is, is go through the book of Romans. And uh, so pray about that as we go through it. But look at in verse 7, it tells who it's written to. Obviously, if it's uh, to the Romans by the name of it and so on. But look at verse one, uh, 7. It says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. All right. To all who are in Rome, loved by God. That's what's written to the to Christians in Rome. And it's a neat thing, and I won't get sidetracked with loved by God, but that's an awesome thing, isn't it? <laughs> an awesome thing. Uh, the population of Rome about this time in Italy was about over a million people. Some say two million or more. Rome ruled the world, right? At that time, it was the capital city of the Roman Empire. Uh, intellectualism was there. Military might was there. They had laws. They had roads. The Roman roads was opened up the world. As much like airplanes today open up the world to us like never before. In those days, it was the Roman roads that would open up the world. And they had their Roman heroes and stuff. Soldiers and, and mighty men. And it, Paul, little Paul, writes a letter to a small group of, a group of, uh, Christians in Rome to a little colony of heaven there as he writes to them they end up turning the world upside down and today it continues through this letter to turn people's lives upside down 
And so I want to get just do kind of an introduction today. So how did the church start? Most likely, this is what most commentators have felt um, how the church began. So if you, you stay there in Romans, we probably won't be there much. But if you would go to Acts chapter 2. And we'll go back to the day of Pentecost. And just read here a little bit uh, of what happened years before this, before uh, even Paul was converted. But uh, verse 1 will begin there, I think. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, and there were about 120 if you read the chapter previous, that suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each one of the, each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What a place. What a time. <laughs> Put yourself in there. And then, then verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred and the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak, uh, heard them speak in his own language. So here's, here's a group. It's a come for festival time. People from all over the world. They've been there for Passover earlier. Now they're there for Pentecost and they come if you were a good Jew, you'd leave your home from wherever you lived and you'd come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost or the harvest that it became. And, uh, and you'd come there and, and, and this is the time that this happened. Okay, So there's lots of people that speak many different languages in Jerusalem. Awesome thing. And uh, then I, I'm not sure if it's the sound of the wind that they heard, but I, I, I tend to think it was the, the hearing them in their own language. They got their attention. Uh, because this was the gathering. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It was a work of the God's Spirit within their hearts. And then, uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a foreign country. Some of you have. And you hear um, in a group loud music, maybe loud people talking. You can hear an American in there. Okay, Even if they're quieter than the other speaking. Partly is because you're, you're, you're attuned to the English language. Okay, it was no secret. When we moved to Macedonia. We didn't hardly speak a lick of the language. We could hear through the thin walls our neighbors saying, blah, 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 Macedon or Americansi. You kind of get the idea. Okay, so they're talking about us. I have no idea what they're saying. I wish I could hear and understand what they were saying. But you get in a group of people also and on a ship or something, we'd cross into from Italy to during the war in Yugoslavia cross off and go to Germany through via Italy and take the ferry boat over across. And you hear all these Greeks speaking, and I can't speak Greek, and I hear all these Greeks. But if there's somebody speaking English in the midst of that group, you'll find them. And Ilse, if, if there was a lot of people here today and we were all talking at once, I bet she could pick out Latvian. And it's your, her voice, her ears would be tuned to it and drawn to it, actually, because it's something familiar to you. And I think this is what happened. They hear all this noise going on and people talking. And all of a sudden you're sitting there, whoa, I, I hear somebody speaking in my home tongue there. And so there's kind of drawn. See what's happening here? It says, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. It drew them. So they started to come around and they were confused because every, why are they confused? Well, it's not normal to hear your own language like this. Confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Verse 7, then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all those who speak Galileans? Galileans were kind of, the, they weren't, they didn't have a good reputation, let's say. They were kind of known for their accent, maybe, <laughs> or lack of one. Or, uh, and so they say, wait a minute, this, this is confusing. He says, aren't those Galileans here? They it's kind of like Americans, you know. You, you know what a, a person who speaks three languages is called? Tri trilingual, right? Tell me the answer. If you speak two languages, how many? What do you call it? Bilingual. bilingual. If you speak one language, 
Americans. You got it. You got it. That's it. So these Galileans maybe were looked down like that, you know, a little bit. And, it, and yet they ask this question in verse 8. And, and how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? How is it? This, this, this is a miracle here. Something's going on. How is it we hear him? And then now, now list the, the country, the people that are there. Listen to this. Parthians. These are the people that are there. The different groups. If today we'd say the Chinese, the, the Japanese, the Indians, the and you go on and name all of these tribes. So he says, here's a group of people that were there. Parthians and Medes and Elamites or Elamites. I don't know how to say that. Uh, those who dwell in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Look at that. And this is how I think the church started in Rome, and many commentators think it did, because on the day of Pentecost, there were some Jews and proselytes. Proselytes just simply means somebody uh, that wanted to convert to Judaism. And could they could be Gentiles, they could be anybody, but they wanted to be converts. And so you probably had Jews and Gentiles uh, pro, uh, proselytes there from Rome that day on the day of Pentecost and they heard and they came to this multitude and they saw what happened so it just tells us the names and I'll keep reading them here Christians and Arabs we hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God without their preaching no none, none of the church out there was going out into the world and preaching the gospel they waited in Jerusalem until what Jesus told them to wait for until they'd been uh, endued with the spirit from on high. Then they had power to share the gospel and go out and share the gospel. And so the wonderful, what they heard them say, they were having a worship service. They were praying, right? They were worshiping God and out of their lips came what? What did it say here? The wonderful works of God. And all of a sudden, Ills hears it in Latvian. Hans hears it in Swiss. And different ones begin to hear it in their own language. Whoa, this is confusing. What's going on here? And you know, well, let's keep reading here. Did I finish? I can't remember. The Cretans, Arab, we all hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying one to another, words, what could this mean? Others were mocking and said, ah, they're full of new wine. They're, they're drunk, you know. They're drunk. Until so you have the same... Things going on. <laughs> Some who see it as a work of God and others who say, you guys are nuts. That still happens today. <laughs> but you see what's happened here? And then if you drop down to, I think it's verse 41, after Peter begins to preach the gospel to these people that now a big multitude is gathered. And in one day, verse 41, that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, were added to the church. 3,000. And you know what, brothers and sisters? <laughs> I believe that some of those converted out of those 3,000 were Jews from Rome and proselytes. They'd come there to worship God, but they got a better deal than that. They found out who Jesus really was and how they could get right with him. And so then they, most likely they go back to, to Rome where they lived and began to worship the true and living God, both Gentiles, these proselytes, and these together, some may have uh, been converted through Paul as well later on in the ministry of Paul. He met uh, Gentiles as well from, from Rome at that time. And so this is most likely how it started. Turn with me in Acts, if you would, to the 18th chapter. <clears throat> Again, this is an introduction, but kind of to, to see how and who the book was written to, we have to get a larger picture. I think it helps us in the study of it. Eighteen and verse one and two, look at what happened. After these things Paul departed for Ath from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who's re recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because in parentheses there, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. All right, this is significant in the book of Romans as we read it. 
but to understand some things that happened. Even before this happened, before Paul wrote the book of Romans, Claudius had set a command, and this is in book history. In fact, I'll quote something from his, uh, the life of Claudius. It says this, that Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome because they were constantly rioting at the instigation of one Christus. Probably misspelled, but Christ. <laughs> Christus in some languages, right? And so he expelled, the, there came a time in Roman history, I mean, you think uh, anti-Semitism is something new, it's been around a long time. And so all of a sudden Claudius, he hated these Jews. And he gave a command that all Italy, all the Jews had to leave. And guess who lived in there and may have been at Pentecost? I don't know. It was Aquila and Priscilla, a couple. A couple, two Christians that uh, got saved somewhere along the line. Maybe it was on the day of Pentecost. I don't know. But they find themselves in Corinth now. And Paul meets up with them there. And Paul, when he meets them, finds out, why are you guys here and so on? Who are you? How did you learn about Christ? Whatever happens, they begin to work together and they found out, ah, Claudius kicked all the Jews out of, out of Rome, out of Italy. And you guys came south. And they're not the only ones, right? There's a lot of Jews in there. And so the church that had begun up there, the Gentiles could stay, right? The Gentiles could stay. But if you were a Jew, you had to leave. So that would be uh, quite a thing. How would you feel this morning if we were here, and many of you have French-Canadian background, I think, I assume, just we were so close to the border. Uh, but what if, what if uh, for some reason, the governor of Vermont said, I want all you French-Canadians out of here? So all of you who are French-Canadian background have to leave the church. It's going to change the outlook of this church a little bit, wouldn't you say? It's probably going to diminish the numbers, number one. But now your influence, too, is going to be gone. And so it's just going to be a few of us left. Makes me kind of a joke, but I'm not going to tell. It's not a joke. It's actually happened. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll leave the French alone. We want you to come back. But you see what effect it had on the church then at that time? It didn't. I, evidently in history, that uh, banning of any Jewish people from there, didn't last a long time. It came free after Claudius' death, which he didn't live that much longer. And that ban was lifted again. And Priscilla and Aquila, anyway, the two we're talking about this book of Acts, moved back to Rome because when Paul writes them at the end of this letter, he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila. And so they're back in Rome. The ban had been lifted. Paul built tents with them. That was their occupation. So Paul worked with them for a while. And then he goes back. So that makes it interesting when you find out later on why Paul talks to the to the church at Rome, and he kept saying to him, and especially towards the later chapters, you keep hearing him say it over and again, uh, receive one another. Receive one another. Because often throughout history, <laughs> they haven't been on the best terms. And it was a newer thing in order for Jesus said, I kind of, you know, broke the middle wall of partition as between them and united them together. And so they're one. But they had been ousted. Now it's a mostly Gentile church. And the Gentiles grew in number and, and are outnumbering the Jews that are in that group. And you can see it by some of the things that are written in this book. And we'll look at that later on. But it was written, most likely the Bible says that it was written, if you read the names listed and so on, you find out it probably, Paul wrote this letter probably when he was in Corinth. Towards the end of his ministry, he spent three months there. He spent, just before this, he spent a year and a half in Corinth. So he knew a lot of people in Corinth. And uh, just so we can see some of the names here, just so we can see that it was written there, most likely from Corinth. Let's go to the 16th chapter of Romans towards the end, the last chapter of it, and see some of the people he mentions. You find out that they were in Corinth. And uh, he starts off with the beginning uh, verse 1, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a great, who is a servant, or some of your word, uh, deacon, of the church in St. Crea, that you may receive her in the Lord as a manner worthy of the saints, a sister in whatever business she has need of, of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many, and myself also. So at some point in his ministry in Corinth, you find out, too, if you read Corinthians, that she was from uh, Sancria, which was just about six miles from, 
from uh, Corinth. Okay? And so Paul is there, and most likely he sent the letter with her, with Phoebe. And so, but the people in Rome and the Christian didn't know Phoebe, and so he has to tell tell him a little bit about her. He says, listen, I commend to you, Phoebe. Letters of commendation were written to people because there weren't that many public houses you could stay at, and they weren't the best places. And so if you had another Christian, uh, and that's why, you know, we, we welcome people if they want to visit some friends of ours in, in Germany or in Macedonia, you know, you have a place to stay. And But if it's, you know, can I trust them? Well, you send them a letter and say, hey, listen, Ryan's been there before. Ryan can say, hey, so-and-so is a friend of mine. Mind if he just stands a day or two with you guys here? You know, it, coming from Ryan, since he's been there, would be more likely to believe. And so in those days when there were so many false prophets as well, but he says, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in St. Korea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and a sister in whatever business she may have need of you. So not only did she deliver the letter, but she was maybe there on business or other things. And he said, you know, a sister and help her. He says, indeed, and he says this about her, that she has been a helper of many and of myself also, patron to many. She supported Paul. Amazing. You know, you wonder how Paul did it. He had people that supported him financially, gave him a place to stay and these things. And he said, he can't say, I mean, isn't that a neat thing he said about Phoebe? That she's been a patron, some of your versions will say, a patron to many. She's helped, she's helped many, but not only, she's helped me, Paul said. She's been a great help to me in the ministry and so on. And so it's a neat thing. And uh, other people you'll find that he refers to in uh, verse 23 of that same chapter. If I can find it here, 23. Gaius, we talked about him not too long, but that's a different Gaius. Okay, that's a very common name. Gaius, the, my host and the host of the whole church greets you. So Paul, remember, he's in Corinth, and Gaius lived in Corinth. In fact, he baptized Gaius. If you look at 1 Corinthians, he's, Paul said, I didn't baptize any of you except the household of, and he mentions Stephanus, I think, I can't remember exactly, and Gaius, I believe. He mentions these two. So, And evidently, he's staying at Gaius' house, and that's where the church there at Corinth met. And then he mentions in that same verse of greetings that he's sending along with the letter, he says, Erastus, the treasure of the city, greets you. And that he was uh, treasurer and became uh, uh, the city commissioner at, at Corinth eventually. And so most people think that's why, again, the book was written from there. See, you, see how things kind of fit together when you begin to study it a little bit? It was probably written from Corinth because these people were here. Uh, and to know the history a little bit helps uh, you understand as well what Paul was referring to at times. But not only this, Paul didn't write the letter with his own hand. He he uh, had a, he dictated the letter and to somebody. He told them what to write down, and they wrote it down. And that you see from verse 22. It says, Timothy, or no, I'm sorry, I, Tertilli, uh, Tertius, I don't know how you say that, uh, who wrote this epistle, greets you in the Lord. See, he wrote it. This guy wrote it. But Paul, he dictated, and he wrote, ter, uh, ter, Tertius wrote it. So for 25 years, Paul had planned, planted churches in uh, the Mediterranean area. And uh, at the same time now, he was preparing to go to Jerusalem. And he lets them know that he wants to visit Rome soon on his way to Spain. Okay, so if you just turn to chapter 15, we'll just read a brief part here. <clears throat> I think it helps us get an understanding of Paul's intentions as he writes this letter as well. Starting at verse 22. And you read the first chapter, you find his intent was to go eventually to go to Rome. But in verse 22, he says, For this reason I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. See the longing of Paul's heart? I, I want to go to Rome. He had that in the back of his mind. There were times when he, you know, he, what hindered him from going partly was his ministry there where in sharing the gospel where he was. And there says, for many years, I desired to come to you. In verse 24, where, uh, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. Hey, here's the intent of Paul. 
I'm done working in these areas here. The gospel's been preached. Now I'll let the local churches handle this area. I'm going to find some place where Christ has never been preached. I'm going to go to Spain. He says, but on my way to Spain, I want to visit you guys. And in verse, uh, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. A nice letter, isn't it? I want to enjoy your company for a while and benefit from you guys and so on. Financially, probably, and in other ways. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a, a certain contributions for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. You see, and if you read the epistles, you find out that some of the churches were Paul took collections from the churches. Hey, it's from the Gentile churches, Macedonia and Achaia. They, they wanted to get some money together. And Paul and his delegation brought some from some of the different churches and they they were going to take this money to the, Jew, uh, to the Jew, poor Jews in Jerusalem. And this is what Paul was about to do. And uh, so this is kind of the last thing on his list before he was able to go to Rome. Um, for if the Gentiles have uh, been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have se uh, sealed to them this fruit... I shall go by way of you to Spain, but I know uh, that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I think that's just, no, yeah. You see, you kind of see from, from the letter that the very end, what his intentions are. He's, he's in Corinth writing the letter. Soon he's going to make that final collection of that money. He's taken down to Jerusalem. He asked them to pray about that. That is, it would be accepted later when he comes to there. And then he says he hoped after that to go to Rome and spend some time with them and be encouraged by them and uh, on, on his journey there. So you kind of, kind of get the picture here. It's kind of, I hope you're not bored to death with this yet. But I think it'll open us, uh, help us as we look at certain issues of it and so on before we're done. But... Let me say this, and all this saying about Rome and so on, this book is written for you and me. It doesn't do us any good if we think it's just for the Romans, does it? This book, like it was for Luther, like it was for John Wesley, it is to you and to me. It changes lives. And I would encourage you, since the message really here of the book is, uh, is how to get right with God. It focuses on God, how God acted through Christ. To bring us into a, each individually into a relationship with himself. And so the first four chapters uh, provide. The, uh, let me see. How do I say this? Uh, let me just give you just briefly an outline. The first three chapters actually deal with sin. Uh, it tells us what's wrong. This emphasis really on the holiness of God. How holy he is compared to our sinfulness. What an awful thing it is. But then verse uh, chapters four and five. Tell us about salvation. Tells us then how do we do get right. But tells us the problem and how to, how to fix the problem, the answer to the problem. And then 6 through 8 talk about sanctification. There's 9 through 11, how to or last and grow in faith and so on. 9 through 11 deal with the sovereignty of God. And 12 through 16 to the end kind of deal with more with the service to God. And so that's kind of just an outline of it and, and Martin Luther said this about Romans he says is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart the whole book can you imagine the whole book heart by heart uh, but occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of his soul it can never be read or pondered too much and the more it is dealt with the more uh, precious it becomes and the better it tastes you know, I can say that I amended that because since last June, I think I began to really delve into it, study it. And every day since then, I've looked at Romans and looked at the book of Romans, looked at some verses in the book of Romans. And it's just, it's becoming more and more wonderful. I find it's true. We had, uh, growing up, we had to memorize some chapters of the book of Romans. Our parents felt it was, uh, maybe we had to memorize the sixth chapter, I remember, the eighth chapter of Romans. And uh, so it's it's a good thing to do. Um but let's, let's just take the first word 
of this chapter and say, I'm not going to go this slow, okay? I am going to take it basically how your Bible might divide it. It's going to be close to that. We're not going to take one verse. I know as pastors who've done that, it took them five years to go through the book. We're not going to do that. <laughs> We're going to take kind of a section at a time, how your Bible mostly divides it. And so generally, if that'll probably be a good break. But I just want to read verse 1. Um, it says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. And that's as far as we'll read today. I'll make a few comments and we'll be done. But Paul, he begins, you know, we, I have told this before, but we always be, end our letters with our name, sincerely or love, so-and-so. And, and here in these days, and it makes a lot more sense, and I wish we'd go to that. And some emails we do now, don't we? We write the name of the, no, we don't, actually we don't. But Paul, you know who wrote the book right away or the letter, because right away they'd start with their own name. I remember hearing Adrian Rogers say that one time a pastor was up preaching and somebody in the congregation who hated the pastor uh, sent up a note at, and uh, wrote, wrote a word on it and, and, and sent it up with one of the ushers. And the ushers, not knowing what, what the guy had written, thought it was a personal note that the pastor needed right away. So he sent it up to the pulpit. The guy reads it and had one word on it that said, fool. And so he looks at the note, and reads the note, and he says, you know what? So many times I get letters that are written by a person who forgets to sign their name. He says, but this time is the first time I've ever gotten somebody sign their name and forget to write a message. <laughs> but he wrote, it began with his name, Paul. So you know who wrote it. And it just makes a lot of sense to do, begin that way. But what, kids, maybe you can tell me this. What was Paul's name before it was Paul, became Paul? What was it? There you go. Good. You guys are on top of it. So when Saul was born, uh, when his mama had him and, and they looked at him, and the mama probably said, you know what? I want to name my kid after King Saul. First king in Israel. He was head and shoulders above everybody, taller, handsome, self-willed. <laughs> uh, but he, he eventually, he just reeked with pride. He went his own way, did his own thing. And Paul, Saul kind of took after him in that sense as well. Saul was a Jew, but also a Roman citizen, a free man, honors graduate from the tar city of Tarsus, a well-educated, very educated man. Some think he was fluent in a few languages. He'd been to Jerusalem to sit under the personal scholar Gamaliel, who was at that time would be regarded as the probably the best teacher in the world at that time. And so he sat under the best teachers. His parents probably paid for him to go to the school of Gamaliel there to learn. And uh, then later on, he was a Pharisee, became a Pharisee, one of the rulers in Israel. You know what the Bible says of him? And he says of himself too, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. You know what that means? He was a leader of the leaders. So Paul, you couldn't get much high, higher than Paul was. As far as that. And so he's a leader of the leaders. He was praised and prized. He was a big shot. With a big shot name. Saul. Saul. And he wreaked havoc in, among the churches. And those he began to persecute the church. But remember what happened that day? He was going to arrest some. In, where was it? Can you kids help me out? What town was he going to? To grab the Christians. I drove. But what? Damascus. That's right. He's on his way there to Damascus. And what happened? What, what happened all of a sudden on the road? Why did he fall to the ground? I hear it. I don't hear it. What's that? He saw a great light, right? Saw a great light and fell to the ground. And then the voice speaks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, well, well, who are you? Who are you, Lord? And he said, what was the answer? Do you remember? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. I'm Jesus. 
So Paul saw Jesus. He saw Jesus in a light anyway. And, saw, and he was blinded by it. And his life was totally changed. And he became a follower of Jesus. And later on he changed his name to Paul. And everybody started calling him Paul. You know what Paul means? Small. Little. Going from Saul to Paul. Isn't it interesting what conversion can do to a person? <laughs> can humble them? It humbled Paul. You know, that's one of the signs you know if you're if you trusted Christ, because you'll have a humble view of yourself. You, their humility comes. You can't be proud and get saved at the same time. You have to humble yourself and become as a little child, remember? Jesus said. And so what did Paul think of himself? Here's what Paul thought of himself in Ephesians 3.8. To me who am less than the least of all the saints. Think of that. Here's... Here's a man who was top in the line. God humbles him, and he refers to himself as the less than the least of all the saints. Saints in those days were just the Christians. All the letters were written to the saints at, to the saints in Rome, to the saints in Corinth, to, <coughs> to the Christians. Those who belong to Jesus now were purified, were saints. And so he writes to them, and Paul says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace has been given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I have an awesome privilege, Paul said, and I'm not worthy of it. I did it today. You know, I put on my shoes and for the first time in my life, I think. I put on these shoes are worn out. I super glued them this week again. And I love these shoes. And I'm not asking anybody to buy me a pair of shoes. I got the money to buy them. It's just I like these shoes, okay? So I don't, I was afraid if I say something like this, somebody's going to go out and buy me some shoes. But I, as I, before I put them on, I said to him, you know, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I just said, look, I'm going out to preach today. And I've got some shoes that will keep me warm going over here. But these legs can carry me to where I can preach the gospel. And Paul says, you know, I, and I'm not worthy of it. I, I'm not worthy to preach this gospel. And Paul says, I'm less than the least of the same. But, but he says, the grace, God has given me the grace to do this. And I have the privilege, he says, of preaching to, to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I have that same privilege that you do too, to take this gospel to everywhere. And then he says later on in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, for I am less uh, the least of the apostles. And I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Nevertheless, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You see, he humbled. Saul of Tarsus became the apostle Paul, the little one. He humbled himself and God used him in a mighty way. And if you want to be used to God, you have to be humble. But as we go through this book, it's a book about salvation, understanding it, uh, the plan of salvation, recognizing that we're sinners. And so what I'd, I'd encourage you to do this, especially for the next few weeks anyway, as we go through the, the plan of it, invite somebody, maybe an unwilling soul like John Wesley, <laughs> to come listen to something about the book of Romans and pray that they're converted, but also pray that in my own heart I would understand this book like I never had before. And that God would revive us, send a work of His Spirit so much in our hearts that it will revive us in our own hearts and our own communities. I believe that God can change through the preaching of this book in general, but how much the book of Romans when it really points out how I can get right with God. It's an awesome thing, and I look forward to going through it. I'm excited about it. And so I just pray and encourage you to invite people, but also study it ahead of time. Look at it next week before you come here. So you maybe have some questions, hopefully will be answered. And if I can't answer them, I'll go try and look. And, but uh, study it together. Amen? Does that make sense? All right, let's pray. Father, we're here today. We thank you that you have done a work, Lord. We thank you for Pentecost and those that were saved at that time and how the gospel spread to Rome and uh, throughout this 
the area there, but Lord, I thank you how the gospel has come here to us and who we find ourselves here in Swanton here this morning. We're grateful that the same God, the God of the Apostle Paul, is our God. That things haven't changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And oh, how we need a work of your spirit, Lord. Move in our hearts and in our lives. And Lord, as we go through it, I pray that as our friends and maybe relatives and we can encourage to read the book of Romans, Lord, we'll come to a living relationship with you. Vital, Lord. So help us as we go through it, we ask. And by your spirit, do work. And I pray your blessing, Lord. There are, there are many here this morning who are, we've been sick or there's others here not today because of sickness. And again, we would ask your touch upon their bodies and their lives, Lord. Thank you for answered prayer, even for last week. And Sarah asking for to pray for her dad because he was flying, Lord, and he's safe today. So we want to say thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. Thank you for many other answered prayer. Deb, uh, Deb's prayer request last Wednesday as well. Lord, there are many that we think of. We just praise you, God, that we can serve a God who actually listens to us and cares about us. And Lord, what we want in our life is your will. And I pray that that would happen in these days, that your will would be known. And these young kids, Lord, help them to, to really know your will at early ages, Lord, and to serve you all the days of their life. Bless them, Lord. Bless the elderly as well. Give them health and strength and grace for each day. And even as this outward man perishes, Lord, I pray the inward man will be new, renewed day by day. Bless Becca, she's back in, in Prague, Lord, and doing her missionary work too. Bless all the missionaries today, Lord. I pray that as they speak the gospel, uh, that it, many would be converted as well. We ask for a work of your spirit in these days. In Jesus' name, amen.